Morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Having a good conference so far? All right, let's, uh, let's do this. So I thought we'll just start with something not related to Kubernetes. Um, this is a project called DALI. I'm sure you've come across, or DALI Mini. You, you provided some text, and it gives you uh, an image. As you can see, Donald Trump in Mario Kart 8. People play Mario Kart here? Yeah, you might have played. So I thought what we'll do is we'll start with maybe if you can guess what the caption was provided and what image got produced. So I know this has nothing to do with Kubernetes, but it'll become clear in a second why I'm talking about this. Can anybody guess what's happening here? Any? There's Godzilla in there. There's Court. Godzilla on trial. So there's basically a core sketch of Godzilla on trial. Uh, anybody played Connect 4? Anybody played Connect 4 with cucumbers? With AI, you can play Connect 4 with cucumbers, as you can see here. So Connect 4 with cucumbers. How about this? What is this? What do you all think? It's a toaster in a bath. It's not just any toaster. It's, it's a happy toaster in a bath. So with this, with this AI, we can, we can do something like this. We, we, we got uh, Gandalf here doing some vape tricks. Not, you know, they actually didn't ask Gandalf to do this, but we could do some stuff like that. If you want to check some of these out, you can see it's um, Dali Mini generates that. One, one last one before we finish. This Kermit painted by Edward Munch, you know, the person who uh, sketched the, uh, the screen. But you can see this is quite good. Now, the reason why I mentioned these is because all of these topics here, all of these technologies used to do come up with something like this, GP3, Dali, and Clip, they buy a company called OpenAI, I'm sure you're aware of, and they're all trained, the model is trained on Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is the point uh, of discussion today, and Kubernetes Scheduler, we'll go into that in a second. And they trained this using 7,500 worker nodes. And they've had some issues with scheduling of the pods of where they run. And they managed to fix it by understanding the details of, uh, of the scheduler, how Kubernetes Scheduler works. So I thought it might be a good idea of, of, to understand what it actually is. What, what is a Kubernetes Scheduler? How does it work? And how we can influence it. Uh, my name is Salman Iqbal. And I am an MLOps engineer with Appia. I'm also a Kubernetes instructor with a company called LearnK8s. Check it out, learnk8s.io. We've got a bunch of blogs on there, and we do Kubernetes training as well. And you can follow me on, on Twitter, uh, on Solmanik. Well, I do also have a YouTube channel, so I'll plug it in. Uh, I make small uh, Kubernetes videos, so you know, like and subscribe, whatever people do nowadays. So, so that's me there. Now. I thought what we'll do is do a quick recap of what containers are, and then we'll go into Kubernetes, and then we'll talk about the scheduler itself, how the Kubernetes scheduler works, how it uh, puts the workloads on Kubernetes. So what you have is a runtime of some sort. In this case, we're saying Java Virtual Machine. It could be any runtime, Python, or, or whatever it might be. And we get all the configuration files, all the artifacts and assets alongside of the application, and we stick them all in together. And we put in any other dependencies that might be, for example, Java cryptographic extension, and stick it in what we call a container, uh, maybe a Linux container, and this is how we end up with a container. I'm sure you already know all of that stuff. So once you have a container, one container you can spin up, you can start, you can stop, and that's absolutely fine. But there's some limitations. Uh, if it crashes, you have to start it again. If you have multiple servers, you have to, how do you figure out deploying those containers on multiple servers? How do you scaling? And this is where Kubernetes comes in. And amongst other things, what Kubernetes does is schedule these containers for you, or what are known as pods in Kubernetes. Pod is, could be one container or more than one container, one or more than one container running inside a pod. And the good thing about this is you submit the container to a cluster of machines. In this case, I have three machines. One of them is working as a control plane, the one that's got the Kubernetes logo. That's the one in charge doing whatever it needs to do. And the other are the worker nodes. So you and I can write a request and submit it to a Kubernetes cluster, and it can receive the request. And then it can decide where to place these containers or these pods. We'll say, we'll say pods now instead of containers. Um, so it will decide where to place them. And there's some checks it does before it can decide where to place them. That's what we. <clears throat> That's what we're going to discuss today. So the, the first node on the left is empty, so it'll say, why don't I stick it on there? And then the second one will come in, we'll stick it on there, because it's a replica of the same pod. It won't put it on the first node, because um, <clears throat> if you lose a node, that could be a problematic. 
And then you can keep submitting other pods and Kubernetes decides where to put them. And maybe you have a container with significant CPU requirement, so it gets deployed next to this container, and it basically, you can keep submitting requests to it, and Kubernetes is going to do what we said in the beginning. It will try and play Tetris with the containers and try and pack them all together inside Kubernetes. But how does it do that? How does it decide? Let me put the first one on the first node or the, the, the yellow one on the second node. How does it do that? We might not have just two nodes. We could have hundreds of nodes. How does it figure that out? Well, this is where the Kubernetes scheduler comes in. And this is what happens. Imagine you want to create a deployment. A deployment is a recipe that says how many, what kind of pod you want to run, what kind of application you're running, what kind of container image you're running, and how many replicas of the application you'd like to run. Uh, so you write a configuration in a YAML file, and you submit that to the cluster, and the cluster receives the request. And when the cluster receives the request, uh, inside the control plane, the thing that is in charge of everything, it first goes to a component called API server. And the purpose of the API server is to take a request and store it inside a database called etcd. If you want, would like to understand a bit more about the API server, there's a video on YouTube that I've uh, put in, so check it out. Uh, uh, you can check it out there. So request comes in and it stores inside etcd database. Once it's stored there, about what kind of deployment we would like to create, um, the next component that comes in is a controller manager. And <clears throat> the purpose of the controller manager is to look at your deployment requirement, uh, de deployment that you've submitted, and figure out how many replicas of an application you'd like to, like to run. And it creates that in etcd. This is the database key value database. And then is when the next bit comes in, which is the scheduler. And the scheduler is deci decides where to place these pods. And it's done in two phases the scheduling phase and the binding phase. In the scheduling phase, the scheduler uh, decides the best node for the pod. And in the binding phase, the pod is assigned to the node. And um, as soon as you create the pod in etcd, by the controller manager creates the pod in etcd, it actually doesn't create the pod yet, but it creates a record in etcd, which is a database. Uh, the pod is added to the scheduler's queue. And the scheduler processes pods one at a time. So you could have like, in a, in a deployment, you could have like 10 replicas or people submitting multiple deployments. To decide if a node is suitable for the pod, the scheduler scans and filters only the relevant nodes. And filtering might not be enough. As you can imagine, you could end up with a long list of suitable nodes that you could deploy your container on. So the scheduler scores them. Uh, for example, the scheduler will try and prioritize nodes which might be empty. And we'll look at them uh, in a few seconds on how it does that. So this is all the stages it's going through. Even though it looks like just one block, there's multiple things are happening inside. After scoring, it's pretty much deal is now done. Uh, you, what, what it does is notifies any of the parties um, to check if the binding needs to be delayed, which is when the pod is actually created on, on the node. But other than that, the pod is assigned and it's time to create a binding. And binding is just another Kubernetes object that links the node to the pod. Like a deployment or a service or an ingress, it's just another Kubernetes object. And it's also stored in etcd. And you can do kubectl get bindings to figure out what's inside it. So the pod is scheduled, and all the objects are now updated in etcd. So as in, the scheduler has decided which node the pod should run on. So what happens next? is the request is then needs to be uh, carried out to actually create the pod inside the worker node. The way that works is in each of the worker nodes, we have a couple of things. We have a component called kubelet, which talks to the control plane to figure out if there's anything that needs to be created for it. And if there is, which the scheduler has decided just now that, yeah, there's a pod that you need to create, it delegates the creation of the container to a runtime. Container D, Docker daemon if you're using older version, but all that does is then just run like what you and I would do, run Docker run and actually spin up the container, spin up the pod with a container inside. And the pod is now created. But we talked about the uh, sc um, scoring and filtering phase. But let's have a look at some of this stuff, scheduling uh, and binding in practice and how does it actually work. So imagine you create a deployment. Uh, this is just a simple app. It's just a web app with, uh, um, <laughs> with Red Page, but I need to have one replica running. It does require a GPU. It's just an example. You would never run 
a web app on a GPU, why would you? But this is just an example, you want to run it on a GPU and you, have, you require one CPU or one gigabyte of memory. And <clears throat> we write a deployment file and we submit that to the cluster. And this is the state of our cluster. We have 12 nodes. Some nodes are full, as you can see. That's shown by the capacity of the, the sizes of the, of, the, uh, of the windows here, the, the green and yellow one. Some nodes are empty and some nodes are half full. And you can see some uh, nodes support GPUs and others don't. So basically we have a mix of cluster in here. Now what we need to do is deploy that. What Scheduler is gonna do is in the first phase, it will filter out. And it will filter out any of the non-relevant nodes. Our requirement was to deploy it on a GPU. So in this case, not all nodes support GPUs. So we can discard the ones that uh, don't support GPUs. So they, they can go. And we'll look at that in a second, in a few minutes, how, how does it do that? <clears throat> then we're left with four nodes. Uh, which one should you pick? Um, the scheduler then ranks and prioritizes the one to deploy on. Uh, in this case, there's an empty one. Why not choose that one and, and run, the, run the container on there, run the pod on there? The pod is then scheduled on the node. But how did it do it? Well, you might be wondering um, how the scheduler filters the node first. You know, it needs, we saw in this case, it was quite straightforward. Uh, it needed a GPU and it could filter the rest of them out. How about in other cases? Well, how the, the way filtering in Kubernetes works is done through what's known as predicates, uh, which is just checks. And it does a several of these checks. And there's, there's about 12 of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, just, just mention, a, mention a few of them. For example, we'll do this pod fits host ports. Um, so it checks if the node has the free port that you've asked for. Uh, so if the pod is requesting a port, just make sure that exists before you can run the pod. <laughs> and also check stuff like, has anybody specified uh, that this pod should run on a specific node with a name? And you can do that in, in a YAML file. You'll see an example in a second. And uh, you know, this will check if uh, there's enough resources on the node for the pod to run, so things like memory and CPU. Again, this checks if somebody's asked to deploy these pods on selectors, and this is like about volumes, just making sure there's no conflict of volumes, there's no conflict of disks. Um, <clears throat> again, this is all to do with storage. This is checking if there's no uh, memory pressure. Uh, again, it's just going through a bunch of these checks to make sure uh, to, to filter out things. If any of these things fail, you can kick that out. You can take that out from the list. And uh, uh, check node disk pressure, check node conditions, make sure that you know, uh, the network, uh, the node heartbeat is good, everything's working okay, file system's not full, so it's, it checks all of that stuff. And then it, talks, it does more checks on tolerations, and we'll talk about the tolerations in, in, in the later part of this. And then it, it evaluates um, to check if, you know, if there's any volume bind, binding that needs to happen. But the, the summary of this is that the scheduler itself has a number of checks it goes through before it can filter any of these part, any of these nodes. Um, once it's done filtering, that through this long list uh, that you just saw, uh, if you'd like more information, you can go, go to the Kubernetes docs and read a bit more. Once it's done filtering, uh, it's, it doesn't end there. Scoring is also equally as exhaustive, and it goes through again some priorities, again some checks that it does to give it a score. And some some of these are quite quite good. Um, so this will make sure that it spreads uh, things that belong to the same service, same stateful set or same replica set across the nodes. It will try and not put them on the same nodes. So if you have a deployment with four replicas, um, that belongs to the same replica set, uh, then it will try and put them on separate nodes. Uh, this just talks about affinity and anti-affinity. We'll talk about this in a second, uh, but I, we wanted to list it in here. Um, this will basically favor <clears throat> things which has fewer resources running, and uh, you know, it's got a bunch of these checks. Again, it's gonna go through and make sure that uh, um, these checks are, are, are um, it will give it, give it a score. Uh, and uh, it, again, there's some of these node affinity priority, we'll talk about them in a second, taints and toleration. This one is quite, kind of useful, image locality priority. Um, it favors a node that already has the container image for the pod that you're trying to deploy. So imagine if you're trying to, uh, let's say you have I don't know, 50 or 60 nodes, and you're trying to do a deployment, some of the nodes might already have that pod, uh, that container run before, so it will check, say, oh yeah, this, this image exists on that node, so we'll try and put it there. So again, based on this, this is about uh, make sure that the pods that belong to service uh, run on a different, uh, different node, 
and uh, you know it goes through it and makes sure this is the last one is making sure it just spreads the pots across. The point is the scheduler is trying to do these smart things to deploy the pods across all of these nodes and to do it spread to spread it out to make sure if one of the nodes get goes missing, things don't really go south. So the scheduler is optimized to make the best placements. By the way, if anybody has any questions anytime, please feel free to ask. Uh, I, I, maybe we need a mic through, but please feel free. Put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you and, and ask you. Is everybody doing okay so far? Are we all good? Yeah, excellent. We've got some thumbs up. Excellent. Awesome. So this is Kubernetes standard procedure. That's how it does. You submit that request. It decides. It's basically there to figure out the best placement for your pod uh, on your behalf. And usually, as you saw, there's, there's quite a big list that it goes through to figure out the right node the pod should be running on. And it does it when you submit a, a, a deployment. But sometimes you probably know your application better than Kubernetes does, the Kubernetes scheduler does. So you might want to influence the scheduler. And how can we do that? And this is the next part is about how we can influence the scheduler to place the pods where we want them to place. We've got four things in here. We have node selector, we'll come to that, we'll, we'll look at them, look at all of them in a second. We have node affinity, pod anti-affinity and affinity, and taints and tolerations. So there's quite a few things in here, four things in here that it goes through. And we'll, we're gonna cover, cover them all. So node selector is a simpler strategy to decide which node pod should be assigned. Um, the first step is to assign labels to nodes. So label is just key value pair. And pods have selectors. Uh, this is the selectors that services use to run pod on. So let's take an example. I'll show you an example, and we'll run through a couple of examples, and then hopefully that will make sense. So um, kubect, you, you have these nodes. What you can do is you can run a command. You can do kubectl nodes, uh, label nodes, and name of the node, and you can apply a label. In this case, we're applying a key and a value pair, app equals res, just key value pair. And in this case, we assign this label to the first and the third node. And apologies for showing a deployment file this early on in the morning, but uh, this is a YAML file. We live in YAML world. In Kubernetes, that's a deployment file. And in here, if you see at the bottom, you have this thing called node selector. Sorry, shift, the, the box is shifted up slightly. I'm not sure what happened, but it should be the last two lines. So node selector says app red. So you can imagine, and you, maybe you, you can guess with me. We've got three deployments we need to run. Where do you think it will go? First, second, third, or fourth node? Three replicas. You can put your fingers up, like one, two, three, or four, and I'll, and I'll see. Any, any, yeah, yeah we, got, we got one in the back, yeah, excellent. Yeah, 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 people, people got it, people got it, perfect. Because the size of the, of the pod is, you can fit like two in, in each node, so we got two in the first one, and the one in the middle one, uh, on, the, on the third one. But this is basically an exact match. So it's a hard requirement, you just say, this pod needs to run on that node. And the examples for this is you might have a GPU, and it might have a label on it, and you might want to run a machine learning wor a workload on that node. And then, you know, this, you can keep doing this. You can keep increasing the replicas. If I go from three to five, the problem is that now I, I can only put in an extra pod. There's no space for, for the fifth one. This is a hard requirement. So the fifth one will stay pending. So you might be thinking, well, that's a bit wasteful. There's two nodes which are empty. What can we do? Well, uh, Kubernetes provides node affinity. And there's a couple of things in here. This is, this is a bit long. Required during scheduling, ignore during execution. Preferred during scheduling, ignore during execution. That's the, that's the property that it provides. But I try and remember it as hard and soft requirement. Uh, so required is hard and preferred is soft. Um, so hard constraint is run the pods and nodes with GPUs. Soft constraint is run a pod in UK first, and then run it somewhere else. And so, uh, that's what it does. And again, do we, we do the same thing. We'll take an example. We can label the nodes. So we've got the first and the third node labeled. And this time, I'm going to show you a YAML file with a lot more in it, but it's actually quite similar to what's happening. Uh, the point which is highlighted here, you have to see the, um, the key, where it says in the, in the last block, match expression, key app in values read is doing exactly the same thing as before. And the thing is, what we've got is required during session. So that's a hard requirement. So we haven't really changed much from last time around. But what you can do is when you submit that to the cluster, the request, the same request you submitted to the cluster, it'll go ahead and get deployed in the first node and the third node, because that's exactly what we asked for. 
What we can also do is then increase the number of replicas. Uh, let's increase the number of replicas. And what we'll see is we're still in the same position. What we really want to do in this case is use the other option, which is preferred during execution, um, preferred during scheduling, ignored during execution. But the thing is, because the, you can take this deployment and apply it, uh, but the pods have already been scheduled. One is already pending. So it won't really push the other one into one of the nodes that doesn't have the label. You kind of have to delete the pod if you do it halfway through the deployment. But if you decide from the beginning, you, you, will, <coughs> you want to use the preferred one, that's absolutely fine. It will do exactly that. It will go ahead, and then you can delete one of them, and it will go ahead and deploy it. But so this one, the preferred during scheduling, ignored during execution, is all about deploying to the ones that you asked for, and then if there's no space, then deploy the, to the other nodes. So the next one is pod affinity <coughs> and anti-affinity. Sometimes there might be some apps that you want them to live next to each other. So two pods, you want them to live next to each other. Maybe you're trying to reduce latency because a cluster could be across different regions. And if the cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, is across different regions, there's some latency in there. Or sometimes there might be two pods that you don't want them to live next to each other. Um, maybe some, if, if they run on the same node, you, you might be able to see that what's running in the disk. You don't want to do that, so you can perhaps put them away, and we'll show you, share another example as well. And the way it works is, uh, is based on, again, labels of the pods, and the pods from the same namespace are considered for scheduling. So namespace is logical separation of things in Kubernetes, but this is not cluster-wide. It's just the namespace specific. So, uh, you know, it's the same labels as before that services use. <clears throat> so let's take a look at an example. We've got four nodes. I have this pod called app uh, red. Label has got label app red. And I created a deployment with three replicas. The pod definition is that. It's got this metadata, three replicas, uh, three replicas, and has that label pod red. And they get deployed in this, in, this, in this fashion, the first and the third node. And we wish to deploy a second app. And this time it's a green app. And we want it to be next to the red app. So we, we, want to have, we want it to have some affinity. So we add these labels in here, so pod affinity, and we say, well, it needs to be next to the red app. And this time, when it tries to schedule it, I'm sure you might have guessed it by now, it will try and put it next to the red app. There's some space on the third node. It will go ahead and deploy it there. And anti-affinity, as you can imagine, works the opposite way. It will try and put it away from the red app. So you can change that to pod anti-affinity uh, if it's not next to you, uh, it, will, it will try and find a spot where it's not red, red, next to the red app. And we have the third application we wish to deploy. This is the yellow app. And in this case, we can say, put them next to red and green. And the thing in Kubernetes scheduling in this case is that there's no partial matching. The both requirements have to match. Currently, we don't have any nodes with the two pods or any pods with the two labels, the same labels, so that that will stay pending uh, forever because that's a required requirement. But again, with this uh, node affinity and anti affinity, we can have a hard and soft requirement, just like with, as node affinity. We can even with pods, we can have that. So if we do that, we can uh, with a hard and soft requirement, we can change to just like before, preferred during scheduling, ignored during execution. Um, and if we do change that. Uh, let me just ask you all. So where do you think it will get deployed? One, two, three, four. Any, any, any fingers in the air? Nowhere? People think nowhere. Well, I've got a four in the back. Uh, to be honest, it can go anywhere because there's no partial matching. It could go to the third one. It can go to the second one. It can go to the fourth one because it's just a preferred requirement. It's not like a hard requirement. It's a soft requirement. Pod anti-affinity works in opposite way. And this will, this will ensure that uh, <clears throat> basically this, it's not scheduled next to the, the red and, uh, and green pod. But not just one of them, both of them. That's what, that's what it will do. There's a couple of things you have to be careful about. This is all customization, I'll, and I'll say in the end. Uh, so this is <clears throat> pod and affinity and affinity could take time. Imagine you have thousands of pods. You have to run this calculation to figure out which pods have labels, where does go what. And... <clears throat> It's quite useful if you want to schedule pods together, if you want to minimize latency. And uh, maybe sometimes you don't want to uh, schedule pods in the same node. So ingress, for example, is a good example. If you, don't, wanna, uh, you don't, want, don't really want two ingresses to end up on the same node, 
Ingress is the one that deals with the external traffic that comes in. So the Ingress pod, you don't want it to end up on the same node. So you can give a, an anti-affinity to, to itself, so it can repel its, itself. So this is the last one, and uh, in, in terms of uh, customization, in terms of giving hints. Excuse me. And it could get a bit confusing because of the way the, the, the API works, but hopefully we'll, make a, we'll, we'll get to it uh, together, get through it together. So what we've investigated so far is whoever writes that deployment file is in charge of what gets deployed where. So as developers, we can deploy uh, uh, anywhere we like, and we can just say, oh, this pod should go here, this it should go on that node. But in this case, whoever's in charge of a cluster, so an administrator is in charge of a cluster, can decide decides where your pods actually end up. So in short, nodes can repel pods. That's the, that's the thing about this. Some nodes can reject pods that you're trying to deploy to. It's similar to the node selector, but the way it works is uh, every node has a label, just like we had before. Pods had labels, key value pairs, but it comes with an effect. And the effects, there's three effects. There's no schedule, prefer no schedule, and ex no execute. And it's better to remember them as hard, soft, and evict. And the thing is, it's a little bit weird the way it works, but I'll explain to you. If, with an example, imagine I've got three nodes here. And I taint one of the nodes, like it's a, kind of like a label. I taint one of the nodes with app yellow no schedule. And the way this works, bear with me for a second, is uh, I've got the first one here, app equals yellow, no schedule. I've got the second one here, app equals green, green prefer no schedule. And if I try and deploy this red pod, and I say uh, toleration app equals red. So you create a deployment with a toleration of app equals red. And this is our requirement. Now the thing is, the way you look at this, the request will come in. You will look at the first node. And the first node has app equals yellow, no schedule. And the way it gets applied is if the pod tolerates that label, the effect is ignored. But in this case, it's saying if the pod has app equals yellow, you ignore the no schedule. You can come in and live in the first node rent-free. I mean, not rent-free, but you can live there. But if you do not tolerate that label, you cannot run here. So it goes to the first one, it rejects it because the pod has this red label toleration. It goes to the second one, it says prefer no schedule. Well, app equals green, it doesn't have that label. It says, well, if you can't run it elsewhere, then you can come here. So it goes, okay, we'll keep that in our, in our back pocket. The third one doesn't have any labels, so it goes in and deploys in the third one. Does that make sense? Some nods, okay, good. Um, so, this is, this is how it works. Now, if I take the same deployment and increase it to three replicas, if I increase it to three replicas, what will happen is that two pods will run on the last node because there's no label. And then the second one, which is in our back pocket, it will basically go ahead and deploy it on the, on the second node because it said prefer. And this is how you make the node in charge of what actually runs inside the node itself. And if we decide to scale it to five replicas, as you can imagine, uh, the, the fourth one will run in the middle node, but the fifth one is not going to run anywhere because the first one is very strict. It says, unless you have app equals yellow, you cannot live in that node. And sometimes what you can do is you can decide to, let's say we, let's look at this label, uh, app equals green and this, uh, this action, no execute. What happens when you apply no execute? Well, in this case, green app equals green. The, the app that is running inside the third node doesn't have app equals green label. It has app equals red label toleration. So it will basically evict those pods. If it doesn't tolerate that, it'll say, yeah, you can get out of here. So you, maybe you need to debug something or maybe you need to upgrade that node. Uh, you can use that for evicting some of the pods. If we decide to create a deployment with a green pod, again, we just say app equals green toleration. So if you tolerate the label, we ignore the effect, the effect that happens. So in this case, the effect doesn't apply to it. It comes in and lives there happily. So it's common practice to taint the control plane or the master node, that sometimes it's called, um, with a no schedule because you don't want the workloads to be running on the control plane because control plane is already busy running multiple other components anywhere. 
And this is what happens when you know when you uh, when you spin up a cluster. What you do is the control plane doesn't run any of the any of the worker nodes, and then it just all the workload runs on the rest of the pods. Now, if you're sitting there and thinking to yourself, there's a lot of customization. There's a lot of things to consider. There's like tolerations. There's taints. Uh, there's labels. Um, it's getting a bit confusing, and it, to be honest, it really is. If you think about a scheduler is doing this, if we try and if we try and use everything that Kubernetes gives us, uh, if things go wrong at the middle of the night, 3 a.m., the pods are not getting scheduled, this is going to be yes at 3 a.m. in the morning, trying to figure out what's gone wrong, debugging the issue, and uh, having some smoke. So, but it, the thing is. Kubernetes is a gift that keeps giving. It doesn't just end here, but we can still customize more, right? We can still customize more. At the beginning of the session, I said, well, scheduling is done in like two phases, the filter and score, but uh, the scheduling, I'm sorry, binding. And in the scheduling, we had these bits. To be honest, uh, it's actually a bit more granular. Uh, the the, the uh, filtering phase is broken into pre-filter and filter. A scoring phase also has like multiple stages it goes through. And uh, all the blocks in the scheduling phase are customizable and pluggable, so you can write your own logic if you wanted to. Um, and uh, the, in the binding phase, you can see this is also broken down, but they're not customizable or pluggable. So in the beginning bit, if you don't like the, the way it does filtering, you can write your own code and figure out, uh, and plug in your own code and do your own filtering if you wanted to. So <clears throat> this is just a pseudocode. Uh, all this does is, if you look at the middle one, the QSort plugin just takes two pods and gives you one, uh, it returns one, tells you which one should be prioritized over the other one. So if none of the options work for you, node selector, pod affinity, anti-affinity, taints tolerations, uh, custom, uh, plug-in custom, uh, plug customization, you can write your own scheduler from scratch. You can say, um, you can write your own full scheduler and you can find an example of, of them uh, all over the internet. And when you define a pod or a pod template like this, you define the, uh, define the custom scheduler. You say, this is the scheduler we would like to run. And the way it works is when you define the custom scheduler, the default Kubernetes scheduler ignores the pod. But then it's our responsibility to watch out for pods with a custom scheduler and assign them to a node. And we have to come up with a logic of the scheduler. Entirely up to us what logic we would like to write. Uh, depending on our requirements, we can write whatever we want to write in that logic. This is just a pseudocode example for, <coughs> for a custom scheduler. Again, custom scheduler also runs as a pod inside a node anyway in the first place. So you have to give it all the permissions so you can talk to, to, the, uh, to the API, pull in the information that you need to figure out where it runs. For example, in this case, a bit of bash here, you get all pods kubectl get pods, there's no presentation that's not complete in Kubernetes without writing down kubectl get pods. And then for each of the pods, um, you go through and pick a, a node, uh, um, all, all the nodes, and you pick, um, pick um, you get a number of nodes, and then you pick a node at random, uh, so it's just chose one pod. And then this is the bit, the binding bit. The binding, as we said, uh, as we were saying in the beginning, is another Kubernetes component. And you can see it in, in a little bit. This is just a, it's a call request that's been sent. Um, and in, in the third line, you can see it says kind binding. And it's, all it's doing is just saying a pod, the pod that, that we've submitted to the cluster has to run on the node that's been picked for it. And, and then we basically submit to the cluster. It just gets assigned to the pod. It's just a call request that it gets sent. And that is then assigned. Now, any questions so far? Is everybody OK? I think we're doing good on time. We have six minutes, so we got, we got time. I'll do a quick recap, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to be hanging around anyway. But so, what we talked about is the scheduler is in charge of deciding where a pod is deployed in the cluster. And scheduling, uh, the scheduler goes through two phases, the scheduling phase and the binding phase. And in the scheduling phase, the scheduler filters the list of nodes, which are which uh, uh, using predicates. We saw a number of those, um, and then we, we also saw like taints and tolerations and how that work. And then it ranks the nodes using what are known as priorities. So you know things like oh, is the node empty or does the image already exist in the node? And it prioritizes those. 
And then what we saw is if that's not enough for us, we can um, influence the scheduler to deploy things on, on the node. So we can, the simplest one we can use is node selector uh, to force a pod to be deployed on a node. Uh, so we, we can define in, in our YAML file, it should be deployed on that node. And then node affinity is another tool at our disposal <coughs> to influence the scheduler. And uh, this is basically, we can, we can extend the node selector with affinity so we can have like the soft and the hard requirement if the node is not not available, if, if the node, uh, if there's an empty node available, it can go and deploy it there. And if you want the pods to stay together or close to each other, you can use pod affinity. And if you prefer not staying next to each other, you could use pod anti-affinity. Uh, so if you want to push them away from one another. Taints and tolerations are useful to prevent pods from being deployed in specific nodes. And you can extend the scheduler by writing your own plugin. And you, if you prefer to schedule the pod yourself, you can write and use a custom scheduler. Now, all of these options exist in Kubernetes. But the question is, should you use them? And I, I, I get asked that question, and I tend to just show them this. Um, so life in general, you, you know, there's some pitfalls, but with Kubernetes, uh, the outcome is the same, but maybe sometimes you look cool when you're doing it. But I don't know. That's, uh, that's up, for dis uh, up, for, <laughs> up for discussion. Um, so things are there. Uh, I tend to just basically leave the, the, the node selector is kind of useful, depending on your use case, to be honest. Uh, but you just have to be a bit careful if you have like labels, anti-affinity, pod affinity, things are getting applied. When it goes wrong, that's the bit where you need to know, how do we debug this? If you can't do that, then, you, then you're great. There's a couple of things I'd like to share before I, before I end. I work for a company called Appia, based in the UK as an MLOps engineer. Check out, we've got some like blogs on there. Uh, more importantly, uh, there's another, I also work as a Kubernetes trainer. So if you're interested in learning about Kubernetes, for a company called Learn K8, we've got some pretty cool blogs on there. I, I am definitely not being biased here. Uh, and we also, uh, we also do training. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about it, so it's kind of similar to what we just did now. It's quite hands-on training. And uh, yeah, so uh, check it out, learncase.io. But definitely there's quite a few blogs on there. Uh, one more thing, if you like comics like I do and like beautiful drawings like uh, many, of us, many of us do, my friend Chris Nesbitt-Smith, who's sitting in the back diligently, is doing a talk uh, later today at two, uh, 10 to 3 around policy as version code. Um, it's got cool comics. I don't know what it means, but uh, this, is about, this is about policies uh, and how you can do that. But definitely check that talk out if, you, if you're interested in making sure you run the right thing on your, on your infrastructure and things never go wrong and how you should uh, use them as code. Definitely check this talk out. I highly recommend that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, if not, you can, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, you can message me there. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. If I don't reply on Twitter, leave a comment on my YouTube channel. I'll definitely reply there. No, I will get back to you if you have any questions. Um, so uh, that is all from me. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the talk. Are there any questions, or are we all good? OK, I think everyone's good. The first talk of the day is done. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you all for coming, and uh, yeah, cheers. <laughs>